On May 20, 1862, more than a year into the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Homestead Act to secure homesteads to actual settlers on the public domain. This piece of legislation and its promise of free land would trigger a Western migration that would alter the shape of the Great Plains and the American West. A lot of the ways the term homestead is used is it's the first place your ancestors lived in, in Kansas. You know, that was their homestead. Well, not necessarily. It might have been the first place your ancestors lived, but maybe they did not homestead it because homesteading was a, a government process where you had to live on the land, you had to cultivate so many acres. Living on the land, you had to have a habitation, and you had to live there for five years before you would get the land patent, which that is another term for the deed from the American government that you own the land. We'd like to think, well, it was just a bunch of individual farmers that decided to move out here and settle the West. It didn't happen that way. Uh, they were recruited. You know, they didn't make that decision to come out here just because they wanted to go West. There's the Homestead Act, there's the railroad lands, there's the railroads promoting it. It all fits together. In 1862, there was a lot of surplus land left in the United States, but the American Civil War was going on. So in 1863, the law was enacted, and then the homesteading came through. The settlement by Euro-Americans in this area, in western Kansas, is all post-Civil War. Now the county I'm in, Rooks County, a couple of counties east, almost everything starts about 1875, those settlements. And the, the peak is in the 1880s. By the 1890s, most of the area settled. Homesteading was very, very important on settling the west, west of the Missouri River. They had planned on this prior to the Civil War. They went out to send surveyors out, government surveyors, and they were supposed to do townships and ranges, and they were also dividing into sections of land. But townships and ranges were first, and the township thing gets complicated because some townships are a geographic area, and the other townships are political areas. And you say, what's the difference? Well, a township to the American government is an area six miles north and south and six miles east and west. Why do we call them townships? That was set up with the idea that it took 36 square miles to support a town. And that's where you get the term township. I mean, uh, uh, 36 square miles out here now. Well, that survey system was designed in 1795. And, so. <laughs> and was designed on settlement on the, on the east. In the east, yeah. And then you would number the sections or the 640 acre tracks, which are one mile by one mile within the township, and that was a standardized deal. It was all government control. I mean, it was a statute set up, so the government surveyors came out in parts of Kansas as early as the 1850s. They were measuring it to find out how much was there instead of just estimating. They were looking at the soils. They were looking at the natural resources as far as they, the surveyors would put in trees, uh, good for timber, which would be good for building houses, or rock. In Sheridan County, they talked about a, a surplus of magnesia limestone, which is the yellow rock. Now, there are qualifications to do a homestead. You're supposed to be at least 21 years of age or the head of a household, and these change throughout time or you could be a widow to get a homestead. Another way that they had for a homestead was the soldier script. And you, and you know from the, the homestead stuff that they were in soldier lands where the amount served in the service, in the Union service, not right. the Confederate, right. that they got credit. Yep. Uh, so if they served, we'll use the example of three years, all they had to do is live two years on their homestead to qualify for the five-year yep. minimum. The number of Civil War veterans that came west, of course, at the close of the war, many of these people wondered what they were going to do, but the Homestead Act uh, stimulated, and I'm just amazed at how many Civil War veterans there are that came west. But again, the government wanted to get rid of the land. Get rid of the land, put people on it, taxes are there, commodities are grown, 
And so it was just a development thing and how else to do it. It gave everybody a chance, whether you were American born or not, because one of the qualifications is you were either an American citizen or with the intention of becoming an American citizen. So at the land office, you signed a paper of intention that you were gonna become an American citizen. That's why a lot of people from Eastern and Western Europe came in because America and land speculators were doing a lot of advertising in Europe and saying how much free land was out here and you could get 160 acres, but the minimum was of the government units was 40 acres. The thought of the time, which was kind of confusing, in the Eastern United States, you could make a living on 40 acres because the soil was better, that you didn't have the, the extreme weather conditions that you have on the high plains. And even the, the Kansas congressman at the time, uh, the senators and representative said that doesn't work because in Kansas you can't make a living on 160 acres. There were some of the senators of Kansas were proposing that a homestead would be one section or 640 acres that might be more feasible, but that didn't work. So uh, if a homesteader came out, he had the land and part of the homesteading law was to build a structure on it. So a lot of people started with dugouts where there was to be a, a sloping bank and you would dig a hole. Yeah, so here's a, what is, was probably used as a cellar. But this could have been the first habitation. Uh, we have a, a kind of a curved wall here, but a straight wall over here, uh, meaning that maybe there was a stove put in there. But a lot of people lived in a cellar looking structure called the dugout in the early years. Uh, temporarily, it was shelter, and it was an improvement on the place to comply with the homestead laws. And later, uh, a lot of times, people built the house over the original dugout. We're at the Prairie Museum of Art and History. Uh, here is a replicated sod house that was built in 1982 as a replica on the museum grounds. And it's a very good example of the typical sod house. The sod was available everywhere, and it is from the native grass, the buffalo grass, the grama, the short grass prairie which we're in. When you made a sod house, you wanted the soil to be moist because if it was very dry and you turned the sod over and tried to carry it and build a wall out of it, the dirt held in the roots would fall out, just like transplanting any sort of plant today. And so a sod plow was used in most cases, and it was a plow that had a, a regular steel share on it, but there was usually a kind of a guard that went out, kind of an extension. So as the animals, which might be oxen, mules, or horses, pulled the plow through on the ground and only four to six inches deep, it picked up the sod and laid it over very gently on this big wing. So then you'd have these strips, and if they held together, you would go and cut them. So this appears that there's a joint here and a joint over here. So we're talking two feet on this. They're cut every two feet. And these walls originally uh, were probably two feet thick. So the desired way to build a sod house is to lay a, two or three layers on the ground in one direction. We'll call it this side. We'll do it this way. And then the next two or three layers, or maybe only one, you lay perpendicular to that the other way. So the, they tie into each other and all your joints are not the same. But they do erode. I can stick my fingers back here and this on the east side has eroded uh, three and a half to four inches since 1984. But you can see the thickness of how deep they plowed by the grass lines. This was a grass line that was on top. A lot of times you can tell by the old photographs, people got so from about the bottom three feet they would kind of taper outward with the wall because this is where it erodes the most. The windows, they are deep windows. The window sill at the bottom is about two feet thick. The windows in a sod house were very common because people had house plants and the window sills were big enough to put the plants in, but you also need light because they're dark in there. If not, it's like living in a cave. They were expensive. The glass has probably the most expensive element. And also they, they were, you know, workable, so you could get some extra ventilation in times that you needed. Now these houses are thick. They do stay warm in the winter or warmer than a frame house and cooler in the summer because it is a hot day today and inside it is several degrees cooler. The roof itself, if it's sod covered and it, it rained, it got very wet. The sod up 
up there wasn't enough to keep the moisture out. So one of the methods was to put canvas ceiling in to catch that. Now it was nice to have uh, canvas ceiling in there because when it rained, uh, a lot of the sod houses said that that's when all the insects came down, washed down out of, through the roof and also snakes. Uh, so you had a lot of critters coming in on these. It might be one room such as this one where your bedroom, your kitchen, uh, your work area and so-called living room were all in one spot. So if you were particular, you kept everything neat and tidy because everybody saw everything you owned. And if you weren't, you didn't care. Furniture like a normal house, maybe a, a dresser with a mirror, maybe their grandmother's rocking chair, maybe a, a table that their parents started as their housekeeping that they brought from the east. Other than that, it was pretty crude. The bedsteads were a lot of times very simple. They might have been made of a few boards off the ground, but there were no springs in them. You used rope and crisscrossed from one part of the frame to the other, and then put your mattress or a heavy blanket on that. These would probably last, as this one did, for at least 30 years, but you could do some maintenance on them because there is patchwork in here where some of this dirt has eroded out more. And you can tell the patchwork because they use more of an adobe mix with uh, mud and dried grass or straw in here. And that stabilizes that, especially for a patch. Now did the Euro-American settlers that moved in here invent the sod house? No, they didn't. The prehistoric Indians, such as the Pawnee and others, had been making sod houses for hundreds of years. They knew how to do it. And so a lot of historians say, and especially archeologists, that they should have talked to the experts and not the Euro-Americans that came in, but talked to the Indians on how to, how to do a sod house. A lot of the homesteaders, not all of them, but most of them were young people. Others sent people out. It might be the father of the family or the head of the family would come out and try to settle in before he moved the other family out, which is a very smart thing to do, to move them from the east, that they could live with the parents. And so it's good to come out early, file for your homestead, and break up or cultivate a certain amount of land that showed improvement. So that was part of the homestead law in the main one, but there's also the timber claim uh, where in Western Kansas, you would plant timber and cultivate it for eight years, uh, have a, a thrifty growth, as they used to call it, of trees. After eight years, you could then get the patent or as, again, the deed to do it. Um, and with the timber claim and the Timber Culture Act, of course, you didn't have to be a resident to apply for a timber claim. But you had to plant those trees. <laughs> You're supposed to. In a way, it was scientific logic that just didn't pan out. That in the eastern United States, there were more trees. With more trees, you had more humidity. With more humidity, you had more rainfall. With more rainfall, you grow new crops, and people will come in and grow crops. Because the whole bottom line of the Homestead Act was to people the plains, all this land with nobody out here. The timber claims, uh, you claimed that land, but you didn't have to be a resident, you didn't have to live on it. But the thing was you had to plant 10 acres of timber on a quarter section of ground and cultivate it for eight years. This is a remnant of a timber claim, which we don't see a lot in Western Kansas or recognize them. This happens to be the timber claim of Thomas Pratt, or Little Tom Pratt. But he put the timber claim on this and it's uh, northeast of the Cottonwood Ranch and would have almost adjoined it at one time. But a timber claim was where you could get another 160 acres or quarter of a section of land by planting 10 acres of timber on it. But the 10 acres didn't have to be in one what would be called a wood lot. They could be scattered out throughout. But in John Fenton Pratt's ledgers, he orders a lot of trees and he was a middleman for the timber claims. And he was ordering those out of nurseries out of Salina and Concordia, Kansas. There were cottonwood, there was uh, ash, green ash, uh, there was box elder, there was mulberry, black locust, catalpa, and Osage orange, or what he would say was hedge trees. So these are old trees, and the mulberry, there's no reason they would have grown up here naturally. They had to be planted. And you also see kind of where they're in a row. Uh, mulberries scattered by birds or other wild animals wouldn't have happened this way. He got his patent, meaning the deed of the land on the timber claim in 1896. So that means that these were probably planted, some of these, as early as 1888. Notice at the top of this little ravine, there's a bank of rocks. That is the Ogallala, so a, stream, a spring probably came out here. 
And that's why these are so successful in growing. When I mentioned catalpa in the timber claim, this is a catalpa. These leaves will get a lot bigger uh, as the summer goes on and they will usually bloom a white color. Mulberries were native to Kansas uh, prehistorically, but the catalpa were not. So this is one section of the timber claim, but as I said, there was a, an accumulation of 10 acres in the trees. And behind me, there is another cluster of trees down there. Now, th those happen to be cottonwoods. This is a, an, a good example. So you could scatter a, a cluster of trees in one place, put another cluster of trees in another until you got the 10 acres. And the trees seem somewhat randomly scattered now, but to qualify for a timber claim, they recommended that the, the trees be planted 12 feet apart, 12 feet between each tree, and the rows at least 12 feet apart. And they just want to do that so the trees would be more in an area and also when a government inspector, if they ever inspect it, would see that it was meant to be a timber claim by the spacing of the trees. And also that was for the tree's growth. This is an area where it's kind of hard to see, but the cottonwood trees down here were plant planted in a circle. I do not know why. People were doing picnicking a lot and also they were playing a lot of baseball. Planting trees in a circle might have been an intentional thing to do a, a later picnic ground where people could socialize and get into the area and be shaded any time of the day somewhere around. One reason that we don't find uh, intact timber claims in western Kansas is because the trees have died, but we didn't see any in the early days either because you could get, as I say, 160 acres of a timber claim by cultivating in eight years. And out here, if the weather was good and the trees grew properly, you'd get a tree about this big around. There was no wood out here for posts, so people would cut them down as posts and so destroy the timber claim. Several decades ago, I was out here with a state forester and we'd see in the middle of a tree, in the trunk, where there's a small old rotten stump about this big that had ax chop marks on it. And that's where they took out the main trunk. And then this stuff was second growth going around the outside. But that's a cut, that, that's not a natural break. And these are mulberry trees again, but this kind of illustrates cutting out the core at the bottom and then the second growth coming up around it. And that's why you really don't notice them because they were cut for posts and there isn't a lot of remnants left. The Timber Claim Act didn't go all that well. They, they applied for a lot of them, but it's just hard to grow timber out here. Another way to do it was with a preemption. A preemption, you could go and sign up for a homestead, but you paid for it for a dollar and a quarter an acre. And you could have a homestead and then you could commute your homestead filing into a preemption. So the preemption was a, almost an immediate ownership, whereas the others you had to, had to work at those. So actually, you could get a, a preemption, a homestead, and a timber claim. One person could have all of those. Abraham Pratt filed for his homestead in Kerwin, Kansas. He also bought land from the railroad. The railroad land, the way it was set up with the government, after the Civil War, the government was broke. And so they had all this surplus land. So what the American government did, if they were building a transcontinental railroad, that is going from coast to coast where the companies were, the U.S. government gave a land grant. And it, was, it consisted of every odd numbered section on 20 miles on each side of the railroad line. So you could buy railroad land. And so the first part of where the Cottonwood Ranch now sits is on railroad land. Abraham Pratt came in 1880 and bought land from the Union Pacific Railroad. And he put himself and his two sons on that deed for the railroad. And they paid $1.70 an acre for it. They also, all three of them had timber claims. So railroad, timber claim, they also all had homesteads and they also preempted. We see that people are always finding the, the way to find a loophole in the law or the statutes. Uh, there's one story where there's this one really kind of honest people. They had an 18 year old son. He went to the land office and they asked him if he was over 21. And he said, yes, I am. I am over 21. Well, what his mother had decided is to get a piece of paper and put 21 on it and so he could wear it in his shoe. So when he went to uh, file for the homestead and they asked him if he was over 21, well, technically he was over 21 because he was standing on it. There may be two brothers that came out and so 
you had to live on the land and build a, a habitation of some sort. And so you might build a house on the quarter section line that would divide the 160 acres. You would live on one side of the house and sleep there because you had to have it as residence and get your mail there. And your brother was living and sleeping but on the other side of the house, which is actually in another quarter of land. So here you're building one structure that would qualify because it's big enough, two people living in it, and your residence was, are in two different deals. So there's a lot of things going on, and it was just driving these, I can see these land offices mad. Uh, there's so many things that you didn't have. You didn't have photo IDs as we have now. You had no driver's license. You had uh, no social security numbers. So you could be Bill Smith in Sheridan County. You could be Jake Jones in Thomas County and Frank Brown in Sherman County and get all of these, all this land on different names because there was no proof on it. So that was one of the fraudulent things they did. There's, there's somebody trying to figure out a way every place. Yeah, well, and, and that's what I, I tell too that when a homestead is 160 acres or a timber culture act, it says 160 acres, but it doesn't say a half mile by half mile. We yeah. were surveyed that way, so we have the, the metal block, if you say, that's half mile by half mile. Yeah. Because uh, John Fenton Pratt's uh, timber claim was a half mile uh, west of here, and there's a spring-fed stream, and he went up on 30 feet on each side of the stream until he had 160 acres. Yeah. Several people may live on the same farmstead but didn't follow through with the uh, requirements to get the proof on it. So a lot of people moved in and out. Even at that time, the congressman, uh, the federal government, a lot of people in there said what they were doing was betting that a person could not live on a homestead for five years. So the government was betting the land and the homesteader was betting his endurance. Uh, so it was a big bet that was kind of a a joke uh, that, you know, they're putting out this land and betting you can't live on it. A lot of them did not. With your research, I'd ask, they said that there's about uh, uh, 2.5 people up applied for the homestead or had the homestead before they ever got the patent. Oh, yeah. And I think that's pretty well because I see names of people moving in and out all the time and I've never heard the names or right. anything. Yeah. Yeah, the General Land Office track books, they list everybody that homesteads when it was, well, usually, you know, canceled. Uh, and then the next homesteader, and a lot of times there'll be four or five people that were on that land before somebody finally made final certification. So there was, there was a turnover. I ran across instances where one of them, uh, kind of, these settlers were neighbors, and this guy went over to the other settler and he said, I want to borrow a stamp from you and he needed a three cent stamp so he could mail a letter back east that he was telling his relatives back there he's coming home. And the guy said, well, three cents? He said, I'm not gonna give it to you. He said, I can't, I can't afford to lose that three cents. And I mean, times were tough. And the guy said, okay, I'll sign over my 160 acres to you for the three cent stamp. So that's how important it was for him to go home and this guy for three cents, yeah, he'd give him the stamp for another 160 acres of land. So the land was free in a lot of cases if you could stand to stay on it. The Homestead Act was very important to populate the high plains, especially of Western Kansas. It was very important because this wouldn't have been settled. This is a semi-arid area uh, that if you didn't give away free land to start with, nobody would have stopped. We remember of uh, Zebulon Pike and people coming in in the in the early years and saying calling this all of the basically all the Great Plains the Great American Desert and that stuck in and even during the gold rush years in the Rocky Mountains in the late 1850s miners going across from eastern Kansas or Missouri River say Leavenworth and going across on the trails they didn't stop they went on and they talked about how bad the trails was and how how ferocious the wind and the, the sun was and the blizzards in the winter. There was no time, to, good time to travel. They were passing through too and it wasn't until later after it was surveyed and after the Civil War and economic conditions had changed. And so 
if it wasn't for the Homestead Act to get people here to start with and to get some roots into the soil, and that's human roots, that it wouldn't have happened.